Okay. Thank you, Susanna, for that very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here. It's my first time in Grass, uh, and uh, it's uh, obviously a gorgeous city, and uh, the weather has cooperated, and I think all of us should be in very happy form to be here. Um, what I want to try and address in my presentation this morning is the simple question of how can we improve second language teaching um, in different kinds of sociocultural contexts. If we look at the realities uh, that we see around us, whether we're looking at a European context, North American context, or elsewhere, we see a mixed picture. We see very exciting times in terms of new programs uh, setting up. We see uh, the reality that bilingual programs of various kinds, whether we call them French immersion programs in Canada or CLIL programs uh, in the European context and other contexts, they have uh, uh, proved their legitimacy as viable options for developing second language uh, uh, competence. Uh, there has been explosive growth in some contexts, for example in the uh, municipality of Madrid. Uh, they went from about 25 CLIL programs uh, to more than 250 last year and I understand that the number has continued to increase. Uh, so we're looking at exciting times for second language teaching. And yet when we look at uh, other contexts, particularly when we look at teaching second languages uh, as subjects, we see a very mixed picture and often a very disappointing picture. If I look at the Canadian context, which is obviously the one I'm most familiar with, uh, we have uh, a large number of French immersion programs that are uh, very successful by and large, but we also have the bulk of children in English Canada who are learning French, learning them in what are called core French classrooms. And uh, it's not at all unusual for students to spend five years or more in these programs and come out unable to carry on even a basic conversation in French. Um, my own experience growing up in Ireland uh, suggests that there is a very similar reality in terms of learning Irish as a subject, where a significant proportion of students who spent 12 years or more uh, learning Irish uh, maybe passed the examinations in Irish, but had very limited uh, ability to communicate effectively in the language. Uh, when we look at uh, a different group of uh, students, for example, students from migrant or immigrant backgrounds who are learning the dominant language of the host country, again we see a mixed picture. Here the, the focus is uh, not so much on students acquiring conversational fluency in the language, which by and large they manage to do very well because they're exposed to it outside of school and on television as well as within the school, but often the results in terms of catching up academically uh, are disappointing. We know from the OECD's PISA uh, studies that in the European context, uh, many students from migrant backgrounds lag far behind uh, their peers in terms of their uh, competence in the academic aspects of the target language, and often they drop out of school uh, earlier. So while we're living in exciting times in many respects, we also have many challenges. And what I want to try and address is some of the reasons why the results are often disappointing and what we can do about it. Sorry. Um, so. Okay. so let me start off with a, a quotation from uh, a student who is in a uh, a uh, research study that colleagues of mine uh, and I in Canada uh, carried out in the, uh, about five or six years ago. This was a student uh, who uh, arrived from Israel in grade six, so approximately 12 years of age. Uh, and this is uh, him six years later talking about his experiences in uh, learning English. And the point that he's making here is that the teacher makes a huge difference. Uh, he was uh, part of a panel presentation where students and former students in the school board were talking about resiliency and how they had overcome uh, being seen as at risk. And Tomer uh, says, he says, the English is not a problem anymore. It's second nature almost. The confidence the teacher gives you, it's less the teaching, it's the confidence you get to be able to push yourself forward in the learning. It really comes down to the teachers, I think. And that's a theme that I want to try and weave through uh, my presentation today, that if we can create contexts where the teachers feel empowered, where they feel that they can take risks 
uh, where, where they uh, can uh, go beyond just transmitting the curriculum in a linear way, then I think uh, we can open up the space in our classrooms for students to engage far more actively and to use the full range of their cognitive powers in the task of learning the uh, additional language. Uh, so let me give you an overview of what I want to try and uh, address. First of all, in the title of the conference, we have the word empowering, empowering language professionals. I think it's worth taking a minute to look at what we mean by uh, this term empowering, because as um, we know, it's a term that can be abused uh, quite a lot. It's not infrequent to find um, uh, the word empower being used in the corporate world, and usually uh, in that context it means how to make your workers work twice as hard for half the pay and feel good about it. And I think the word is worth keeping though, despite the fact that it's frequently abused, because it has the word power in there. And uh, when we're talking about um, engagement academically, when we're talking about teachers having the confidence to teach uh, in a way that they can uh, feel like they're really using all of their talents, we need to look at what we mean by power. And as I said before, the scope of what I want to talk about includes the learning of the school language by immigrant and migrant students, and also the learning of additional language in school, both in bilingual and more traditional programs. I want to talk about pedagogy. I want to talk about our orientations towards what it is to teach uh, effectively. And uh, I think what I'll be saying will apply across the range of contexts that I've mentioned. Again, as I mentioned, uh, in both cases, the outcomes range from mixed to disappointing because the pedagogical models employed fail to create contexts of empowerment for both students and teachers. Um, and I'm going to suggest that empowerment uh, requires pedagogy that develops what Patrick Maniak, a researcher in the United States, has called identities of competence. Instruction needs to enable students to showcase their intellectual and linguistic talents, uh, which they've not yet developed. In other words, we need to treat students not the way they are right now, and obviously students when they're starting to learn a second language have identities of incompetence, they don't know how to use the language. We need to project their identities forward to a point where they will be able, with support, to use the language in powerful ways. Um, and I'm going to suggest, uh, I'm going to introduce this term identity text, which is a term we've used to talk about some of the pedagogical work that, uh, that we've done. Okay, so the term empowerment, what do we mean by it? If you look up any dictionary, uh, you'll typically find two major meanings of the word power. One of them is the notion of exercising power over somebody else or over another group. And this is what I'm calling coercive relations of power. And this can be defined as the exercise of power by a dominant individual, group, or country to the detriment of a subordinated individual, group, or country. But there's another meaning of power that you find in the dictionary. And this is the meaning of becoming enabled, being able to do more than you could before. And this typically happens uh, or develops, gets generated in an interpersonal context. And so I would define this as, I would label this as collaborative relations of power. Uh, and collaborative relations of power operate on the assumption that power is not a fixed, predetermined quantity, but can be generated in interpersonal and intergroup relationships. Uh, participants in the relationship are empowered through their collaboration such that each is, each is more affirmed in his or her identity and has a greater sense of efficacy to create change in his or her life or social situation. So this is the notion of generating power with somebody else. The more power that one partner in the relationship uh, experiences or feels, the more is available for others to share. And on this basis, we can define empowerment in a very simple way. Empowerment is the collaborative creation of power. And so I'll try to bring this back to the theme of the conference, empowering language professionals, um, in, when we look at what it means to talk about empowerment. Okay, just an example of disempowerment um, in a very subtle way, and one that happens very frequently in schools around the world that are, uh, have significant numbers of students who are learning the dominant school language. This came from a project that we call the Multiliteracies Project that Margaret Early from University of British Columbia and I were uh, involved in. 
and teachers in one of the schools that we worked in began to talk about language with their students and their feelings towards their home languages. And, and the teachers shared their language learning experiences with the students. And they wrote down um, some of the things that students said. This is um, one student uh, who was in grade four, uh, so approximately uh, age 10 or so, uh, when she was reflecting on this. And she recounted an experience that she'd had when she was in grade one. She says, I'm not always comfortable speaking Cantonese when I have to go to the office for some reason. I don't like it because a lot of teachers are at the office and I don't like speaking it in front of them. I know that they're listening to me. I get nervous and afraid. For example, once I didn't feel very well in grade one, so my teacher took me to the office to, the office to call my grandma. My grandma can't speak English and, and she also can't hear very well, so I had to speak in Cantonese. Uh, so I had to speak in Cantonese very loudly for her to hear. So when I spoke to my grandma, I felt very nervous. Now, the office staff and any teachers who were in the office probably would have had no problems with her speaking Cantonese. But somehow, she picked up that there was only one language that was legitimate in the school, and that was English. And this was communicated in subtle ways, probably at this stage, uh, not explicitly. Uh, because uh, most of the schools that we worked in had very positive uh, orientations towards children's first languages. But somehow, there was a lack of affirmation, a lack of sufficient affirmation of students' home languages and the, and the communication of the legitimacy of these languages for communication purposes as well as for learning purposes. And so that's an example of subtle forms of disempowerment uh, where it's not overt or explicit, but it's still there. So, as I said before, when we look at how students start out, how they're positioned, um, often um, in the early stages, students are, by definition, incompetent uh, in the target language. Um, and so th they can internalize this incompetence unless we communicate to them and the, the directions that uh, we anticipate they're going to be able to move. Um, and when we look at the labels that we use sometimes to talk about students, they define students by what they lack. For example, if we look at the teaching of English to uh, immigrant students in um, English-speaking countries, we often will use terms like English as an additional language students, or EAL, or English as a second language, or English language learner where the defining attribute of the student is the fact that he or she doesn't speak English at this point in time. We typically don't use terms like bilingual uh, or multilingual uh, in this context. And um, so in this case, peers and teachers often see only the labeled student, not the person within, for the simple reason that students are unable to communicate who they are, what they can do, and what they hope for. And they often struggle to escape from this externally imposed identity cocoon. Uh, their inability to fully express their intelligence and feelings over a prolonged period of time can be frustrating and diminishing. Um, so one of the claims or one of the arguments that I want to make is that students will, like, will develop identities of competence in association with the target language only when they're enabled to use that language to carry out powerful intellectual work. Now, if we think back to our own language learning experiences, and obviously in this room there are, there's a vast range of experiences. I'm sure that most of us, in thinking about uh, our learning of second languages in a formal classroom uh, situation, would be hard pressed to identify any powerful intellectual work that we did in that context. And certainly um, in contexts such as teaching French in, in the Canadian context and core French programs, or uh, second language more, more traditional second language programs, the focus tends to be on transmitting the language rather than using the language to enable students to do powerful things with it. Um, I want to illustrate in a very concrete way what I mean by empowerment by taking you inside one particular classroom. And this again was a classroom that, um, and a teacher with whom we worked in the context of the Multiliteracies Project. The teacher's name is Lisa Leone. Um, and we worked with her in the project over the course of two years. Uh, the first year she was teaching a grade seven and eight mainstream class, and then the second year she was teaching an English as a second language class. In the school that she was teaching in, there was a large Muslim population, uh, mainly from Pakistan. 
and Lisa explored the implementation of bilingual and plurilingual instructional strategies as a way of enabling literacy engagement from a very early stage of students learning of English. Now, in a typical classroom, English is the only language that uh, is used um, for the simple reason that often, typically teachers don't speak the languages of their students, and there are multiple languages in these classrooms. So in a normal classroom, if we're looking at newcomer students, students who have arrived very recently, it would be several years before they could engage in any kind of extended creative writing in English. The strategies that Lisa uh, implemented in her classroom changed all of this. Let me just um, uh, give you uh, an example of Lisa talking uh, about her educational philosophy. This was um, in the context of a presentation that we made at a, a, a Teaching English con a conference in Ontario um, uh, several years ago. So Lisa and her students spoke at this conference. My overarching goal as a teacher is to uncover all that is unknown to me upon about my students, linguistically, culturally, and especially understand the community that they're a part of because kids come to school with their parents and their family and their faith community, and obviously the list goes on. And so when students enter my class, I want to discover all that is unknown to me, um, not only about them as learners, but them as people. And, and it makes me think of our drive down where I had to surrender to my choice of music because they wanted to listen to their Indian city. So just allowing that experience to be in the classroom and as part of their life, and, and it's okay. Whether students are given the first language to help them make sense, not only grammatically of the new language, but to make sense of the world around them, since what's inside the language helps students see what they see and helps them make connections to their old and new learnings. You can see here clearly that Lisa defines her role not just as teaching the language, but as connecting with students and uh, trying to respect and bring out aspects of their identity within the classroom. She goes on to talk about one particular student, uh, Tomer, who, whom I quoted earlier on. Uh, she, she says, for example, when Tomer entered my class last year, a lot of the work he produced was in Hebrew. Why? Because that's where his knowledge was encoded and I wanted to make sure that Tomer was an active member and participant in my class. It was also a way for me to gain insight into his level of literacy and oral language development. One of the strategies that Lisa implemented in her classroom was to encourage students to use their first language to carry out academic work, and then they would find a way to get from that first language into, uh, into English. So in, in the case of uh, Tomer, he wrote stories and carried out projects initially in his first language, and then there was a teacher in the school who spoke uh, Hebrew who was able to help him translate into English. Um, here's um, an example of his writing. He was very much involved in, um, uh, with horses. His father had worked in an agricultural setting in Israel before emigrating to Canada. And he reflected on uh, uh, Lisa's strategy uh, of being open to uh, students using their first language. He says, I think using your first language is so helpful because when you don't understand something after you've just come here, it's like beginning as a baby. And that's an identity statement, and not too many 12-year-old boys or girls enjoy feeling like they're just a baby. You don't know English, and you need to learn it all from the beginning. But if you already have it in another language, then it's easier. You can translate it, and you can do it in your language too, and then it's easier to understand the second language. What he's talking about here is the interdependence across languages. There's a lot of research out there showing that there are positive relationships across languages. And that in this context, it makes sense to teach for transfer across language, uh, where students can use the full range of their cognitive powers and their knowledge uh, to carry out uh, academic work. He goes on to say, the first time I couldn't understand what Lisa was saying except the word Hebrew, but I think it's very smart that you said for us to do it in our language, because we can't just sit in our hands doing nothing. And unfortunately, uh, in typical second language classrooms, whether we're talking about immigrant students or students um, from the dominant language group, often the work that they do in the second language is relatively trivial. Um, uh, it doesn't engage them academically. It doesn't engage the full range of their cognitive powers. Uh, there's nothing that they can hang their identities onto uh, in association with the language. 
Um, this is again Tamer writing down some of his uh, uh, experiences and thoughts about uh, using the language. This is written just at the end of his first year in Canada. He says, when I write a story in Hebrew, I feel I'm back to my old class in Israel. Sometimes I feel confused because I feel I'm in Israel again and I start talking my first word in Hebrew. Because I'm saying, I like reading books in Hebrew in Canada because in Canada, people are speaking English. When I, came, uh, uh, when I came to my home, I'm reading my books in Hebrew, and it's fun. In Hebrew, I can read any book I want, but in English, I need to read small books, and in Hebrew, I can read big books. Okay, I think this is, is fairly powerful because it's showing the, limit, the bottleneck uh, that operates when we're confined to learning just through a language which at this, at this point we don't have uh, full uh, proficiency in. Uh, he says, when I'm allowed to use Hebrew, uh, it helps me understand English. I'm thinking in Hebrew and I write in English. If I read in English, I think in Hebrew and I understand more. And he's talking about what all of us experienced in the early stages of learning a second language. We're constantly uh, integrating the input in the second language into what we already know, which is typically encoded in our first language. Okay, this six years later, this is from the same presentation. Uh, that he made, um, that I quoted from earlier on. He says, in my ESL, English is a second language, I was given the most amazing opportunities. My teacher, Lisa Leone, in her classroom, I didn't feel like an ESL student. Uh, all it was, it was a class to develop your English. Not that you're a second class student. You have the knowledge, you have everything. All you need is to translate it into a different language. She gave me the confidence to use my voice and from that ability to use my voice, I use that as a tool in everything else in the world. So I was fortunate enough to be given excellent opportunities that, that I don't think everyone gets. How did it make me feel? Gratitude. I'm thankful, that for, that one, I'm thankful for that one teacher that helped me prevail over what some people consider at risk, not having any English. But she helped me climb over that step, and then everything from that point on was straightforward. There was no lagging behind, no nothing. Again, I think this is powerful testament to the difference that pedagogy can make. This is six years later, and he still remembers those early experiences. Um, a couple of other students in Lisa's class, again, powerful testimony of the difference that pedagogy can make. These were, uh, this was a project um, carried out by three students from Pakistan um, they had been uh, doing a unit on immigration in their social studies class. And two of the students, Sulmana and Kanta, had been in Canada about three and a half years. Their English was pretty good. Mediha had just arrived. And again, if we think about a student who's been learning the target language for six weeks, obviously they have minimal knowledge uh, of it. And in a typical classroom where only English uh, was legitimate, uh, Medija probably would have been able to write maybe one or two painful sentences in English uh, as part of a project. When the rules of the game were changed so that students were enabled to use the full range of their plurilingual competencies, uh, she's the proud author of uh, a 20 page book written in two languages that's up on the web that's been read by thousands of people. Um, the Students suggested to the teacher, this is a culminating activity um, uh, based on the immigration unit, and they suggested that they write a, t a story uh, in which they brought in some of their own experiences of immigrating uh, from rural Pakistan uh, to Canada. And they invented a composite character called Sonia, and they worked out what the story was going to be about. They talked about all of this in Urdu initially. So Mediha was a full participant in all of the planning. Um, they figured out what the storyline was going to be, what was going to be on each page, what the illustrations were uh, going to be like. Um, they were quite uh, forward-looking in their um, uh, outlook. Um, they, there was a very talented um, artist in their class from a Vietnamese background called Jennifer Du, and they outsourced the artwork to her. <laughs> so, um, but when you look at, at this story, um, they were able to use all of the range of skills that they had. They planned it in Urdu, they wrote the first draft in English, the teacher gave them feedback on that draft, made suggestions, they finalized that, uh, then they went back to Urdu. When you look at the tapes 
um, that uh, uh, we've got of the students working. There's a lot of discussion about language. How do you say this in Urdu? No, you need to uh, use a different expression. They went back to their parents to talk about uh, words that they'd forgotten uh, in Urdu. Um, let me just give you um, a sense of how important this uh, experience was for the students by, quoting, uh, by showing you a video clip of Kanta talking at the same conference that Lisa talked about. Hi. Um, we're going to start by um, introducing Kanta, who's um, going to tell us a little bit about herself. Um, hi, my name is Kanta. Um, I'm from Pakistan. Um, my first language was Punjabi, my second language was Urdu, and my third language was English. I came here in grade four, and now I'm, I am in grade nine. How did you feel writing the book in two languages, and how did it, you see it helping you or, or the others? Um, it helped me a lot, and using two languages helped us a lot to understand English better. And for Madiha, who was actually new here, and then like in Urdu, if you would write, um, you would say three words. In English, you would actually have to write five words. So then, if you're thinking in Urdu, you would be only writing those three words. And then, so those sentence structures didn't really make sense. But while we were doing it, it made a lot of sense to her. And then, how it helped me, like it helped me that when I was here, and when I came here in grade four, like the teachers didn't know what I was capable. I was given a pack of crayons and a coloring book and to get on coloring with it. And then after I felt like so bad about that, I am I am capable of doing much more than just doing that. Like I have my own inner skills to, to show the world than just coloring. And then I felt like those skills of me were important also. So when we started writing this book, I could actually show the world that I am something instead of just coloring. And then, um, so that's how it helped me, and then it made me so proud of myself that I am actually capable of some, doing something, and here today I am doing something like that, that I can actually show the world that I'm just not a coloring person. I can actually show you that I am something. So we've, um, we've used the term identity text to talk about uh, this kind of work, where students are creating literature, they're creating art, um, and they're investing their identities into that production. Um, so the, the term refers to artifacts that students produce. They take ownership of these artifacts as a result of having invested their identities into them. And then once produced, once they're out there, uh, these texts, and, and I'm using texts in a very broad sense, they could be iMovies, they could be uh, uh, music CDs that they create, um, uh, so it could be written, spoken, visual, musical, uh, or combinations in multimodal form. Um, once produced, they hold a mirror up to the student in which his or her identity is reflected back in a positive light. And in the context of second language learning, it's reflected back in a positive light in association with the target language. And the, in a way, the, the texts become ambassadors of students' identities. When they share these texts with multiple audiences, grandparents, in, in Tomer's case, uh, he um, emailed his friends back home in Israel and said, check out this website, my book is up there. And because it was in Hebrew as well as in English, they could read it. His grandparents could read it. Um, um, so when they share these texts with multiple audiences, they're likely to receive positive feedback and affirmation of self in interaction with these audiences. And the, the result is that there's much more um, engagement, much more confidence in their ability to engage with the target language uh, or with academic uh, endeavor generally under these conditions. Okay, if we just step back from the concrete uh, for a moment and look at what, what we're talking about in terms of broader pedagogical orientations. Uh, quite a number of people have made similar distinctions to the ones I'm going to make uh, right now, but I want to distinguish between uh, transmission orientations to teaching, social constructivist, and transformative uh, orientations. Um, the difference in the way I'm going to talk about them uh, is that uh, I don't see these as being necessarily in opposition to each other. Uh, we see these as being nested within each other, and they're distinguished by the broadness of focus that they have. Within a transmission orientation, 
um, which and an example of this would be traditional second language teaching where the focus is on teaching the grammar or teaching certain functions uh, uh, to the students. Uh, the, um, the focus is um, relatively narrow. It's the teacher's job is to get what's in the curriculum uh, into, into students' heads. Um, uh, when we broaden the scope and move towards uh, a more constructivist orientation or social constructivist, and the name of um, uh, Lev Vygotsky is the, the one who's often um, most uh, frequently associated uh, with this orientation, the Soviet psychologist who died many years ago. But a social constructivist pedagogy occupies the middle pedagogical space and it incorporates the curriculum focus on transmitting information and skills. So it's not saying that we don't transmit uh, information and skills, we tell kids the rules of the game. We're very explicit in terms of um, what they need to know. But we don't stop there. We broaden the focus uh, to include the development among students of higher order thinking abilities based on teachers and students co-constructing knowledge and understanding. And then finally, transformative approaches broaden the focus still further by emphasizing the relevance not only of transmitting the curriculum and constructing knowledge, but also, in the, of, also of enabling students to gain insight into how knowledge intersects with social realities and power relations. The goal is to promote critical literacy among students. And again, it's not that this is in opposition to transmission or to social constructivists, it's just broadening the focus uh, further. Um, let me just illustrate what I mean by these. I'm drawing from um, an example that a person called Bracey uh, talked about um, in, with, uh, in describing a project that she was involved in. She described a project in which her grades four and five students, many of whom were English language learners, worked with sciences from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. Uh, so the school was connected up to NASA. And they called this project Marsville. And it was a project-based activity where students created a prototype habitat for Mars. So they came together to learn and build their city and to make their own living spaces using a variety of interdisciplinary skills. In the process, they learned creative problem solving, cooperative learning, and data analysis. So clearly a very imaginative pro uh, 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 project, and one that is very different than just learning from a science textbook what the habitat of Mars might be and, and how it might be a difficult place for humans to live. And clearly what Bracey and her students did reflects a social constructivist orientation. Um, but if we think about what a transformative orientation uh, might look like in the same context, um, the Marisol project might be followed up or integrated with a project that examines the problems of human habitats on Earth and the causes of these problems. For example, students might be challenged to design a habitat on Earth that addresses or avoids current urban problems such as homelessness, violence, poverty, and pollution. This would require the students research and analyze source, sources of inequity in, in, in income and causes of pollution and violence and discuss how these problems can be, uh, can be resolved. So it's not that one is in opposition to each other, but there's a broader focus uh, in terms of relevance and uh, legitimacy of, of particular kinds of content. Um, okay, I've described the orientations that exist. Clearly, in the, the, the concrete examples that I gave uh, uh, were, um, in an important sense, challenging patterns of power relations in the broader uh, society. When Lisa, Lisa Leone, the teacher, reached up to that invisible sign on her wall that said English Only Zone, which is a sign that's in schools across Canada uh, and the United States and, and many other places where the only language that is considered legitimate in the school uh, is the dominant language. When she reached up and took down that invisible sign and opened up the space so that students' uh, home languages were legitimate tools for learning, for thinking, she was challenging a pattern of power relations that exist, exist outside the school and within the school. And so in many senses, what she was doing was transformative. Students were enabled to create literature and art uh, using the full range of their cognitive and linguistic skills. Um, but if we ask ourselves, well, how do we know this works? Um, surely in, a, in an era of accountability, it makes sense to take the curriculum and teach it as effectively as we can. 
and particularly in, in some contexts that have uh, a high stakes uh, evaluation system in place like the United States which is um, infused with standardized tests uh, that uh, can be used to fire teachers and uh, to create a lot of pressure on teachers. The tendency is to think of any kind of creative project like this as being off task because it's not part of the, what's articulated in the curriculum uh, in terms of what students are expected to learn. Well, in actual fact, when we look at the empirical evidence, uh, there's a huge amount of data showing that rich intellectual tasks work much better in developing curriculum-related skills than just a simple focus on transmission. I'm not going to go into any detail, but the work of Fred Newman uh, and his associates in the 1990s demonstrated that instruction that generated what he called authentic intellectual work resulted in significantly greater student engagement and academic achievement in subjects across the curriculum than more traditional forms of teacher-centered instruction. As far as I know, he didn't look directly at, at second language teaching, but there's no reason to expect that this, at the same kind of um, pattern would not occur in those contexts. And these benefits were particularly apparent for students from lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. Um, in his work, the way he defined authentic intellectual work involved the construction of knowledge, discipline inquiry, and value beyond the school. Um, if we go to, uh, to data that we're probably more familiar with, the PISA data that the OECD has generated over the last 12 or so years, um, Certain findings come out of that that I think have direct relevance for what we're talking about. First of all, when they looked at predictors of reading among 15-year-olds, reading engagement uh, emerged as a stronger predictor of reading achievement even than socioeconomic status. And when educational measurement people find anything that beats out socioeconomic status as a predictor of achievement, they get very excited. And in the more recent uh, PISA data from 2010, and they found that approximately one-third of the relationship between reading achievement and socioeconomic status is mediated by reading engagement. In other words, what this means is that if we can get students actively engaged with literacy, uh, we can push back, uh, we can um, uh, uh, get rid of about one-third of the negative impact of socioeconomic status on students' achievement. And so again, engagement on the part of students emerges uh, as a very strong predictor. And if we're looking at um, language teaching, I think we can uh, uh, speculate and extrapolate these findings from literacy to second language attainment. We could argue that the attainment uh, in learning any language would be significantly affected by the amount of engagement with that language. Engagement here can be defined as the processing of input both oral and written, and the generation of output for communicative purposes. And again, if we think back to our experiences in traditional second language uh, classrooms, generally um, there was not a lot of engagement with the language. There was learning the language, there was studying the language, but very little engagement. Or if there was engagement, it was often trivial, playing little games in the language that you know, didn't amount to anything. There was very little substantive intellectual work going on uh, in the language. And if you were to ask teachers why that is, they would typically say, well, they don't have enough of the language to do any of this work. Um, and to that argument, uh, I would say, well, if you shut out students' first languages from the classroom, um, then they're not going to be able to do much intellectual work. But if we step back and rethink some of the assumptions we've made about um, teaching second languages, then a lot of possibilities open up as was illustrated in uh, Lisa Leone's class. So here's a, a little framework that uh, I think that I would suggest for discussion purposes. Um, initially, uh, this was a framework looking at uh, the data on uh, literacy development and using the OECD findings but here I've extended it to language uh, attainment more generally. Well, we can argue that the strongest predictor of either literacy or language attainment, second language attainment, is going to be the degree of engagement with literacy or the language. If we ask how we're going to get students to engage with the language, 
think there are four things that uh, teachers need to pay attention to. And again, I'm just going to mention these very briefly. Um, one of them is scaffolding meaning. We need to support students in gaining access to input that they can understand. So we'll use graphics, we'll use uh, demonstrations, we'll, do, we'll use the typical second language toolkit uh, for enabling students to gain access to the, to the content. And then that involves both input and output. And again, you saw how Lisa in, you, uh, encouraged students to use their first languages as a scaffold to produce much higher performance in the second language than they would have been if they were confined only to the second language. My colleague in Toronto, Meryl Swain, and her colleagues have shown that when in, the, in the context of French immersion programs, when students are allowed to use their first language, use English, when they're doing group work to talk about projects, and then they, they come back and report back in French in the target language, the uh, level of uh, performance is much higher than when students are confined just to the target language for their group work. So again, the first language is not the enemy, it's a tool for higher performance in the target language. Secondly, we need to connect to students' lives. And this goes right back to all of the psychological data showing that activating students' uh, um, uh, prior knowledge and background knowledge is a crucial element in any uh, instructional process. Uh, as I've mentioned, we need to affirm students' identity and then we need to extend language right across the curriculum so that when we're teaching, say, uh, immigrant students, it's not just the job of the language specialist to do that. It's the science teacher's job, it's the mathematics teacher's job to reinforce their knowledge of the, of the target language as they're learning the, the language. So I would see this as a starting point for discussion among educators, among teachers in a school in terms of their own pedagogy and the assumptions that they're making uh, in relation to what is effective pedagogy in teaching literacy and teaching second languages. Let me give you a couple of examples of the kinds of things that are possible um, when we expand the pedagogical space. Um, and technology can be a powerful tool in doing this. Um, but it's the pedagogy rather than the technology that's important. We can go back to the work of Celestine Freni, who started his um, work back in 1929 in the south of France um, and set up over the next 40 years a whole network of sister class connections using the postal service um, where students would send culture packages to each other. Um, they would go on, in Freni's own um, class, uh, own school, they would go on what he called experience walks. They would uh, look at things in their environments. They would uh, collect things to send to their sister class. Um, Maria Lodi in Italy in the 1950s, again, we can look for inspiration to some of the things that he did. Um, both Freni and, and Lodi used the printing press to create texts and newsletters for sharing with sister classes. Lodi also used audio tapes, which he called spoken letters, that resulted in students becoming aware of and analyzing regional varieties of, of Italian. So students from different valleys would communicate and send texts, uh, audio tapes to each other, listen to them, talk about the differences in the varieties of Italian that they spoke, and become much more aware of their own language as a result of that. Um, and obviously we have unlimited scope to do this kind of work much more easily right now through the internet and through the, all of the tools available um, that have emerged in the last 10 years. I want to give you an example from one project that connected students in Greece mainly in the island of Rhodes, with students in Toronto a number of years ago. This was work primarily carried out by Vasilia uh, Kazuli in, in Greece. And um, uh, students in grade fives and six were connected uh, and carried out a number of projects together. And just here's an example of a, um, uh, how students became aware of language as they connected. Um, here's a student from Katerina where uh, a student from Canada, sorry, Katarina, who says, I didn't have much of a Christmas this year because I was moving and we didn't put up a tree and stuff like that, but it was fun moving and stuff. You're never going to find this language in a textbook. You won't find the spelling mistakes, you won't find expressions like and stuff like that, but this is what you hear uh, when you look at any or when you listen to any native speaker of any language talking with their peers. This was on kind of an email exchange. She goes on to say, Christmas Eve we went to my aunt's house and had a big feast and me and cousin Maria were chilling out. 
Well, probably a lot of the teachers in this room have just chilled out when they see an expression like me and cousin Maria. It's bad grammar, but that's the way kids talk. Um, on New Year's Eve, we went to my mum's friend's house uh, and celebrated it there, and we brought in 1999 uh, with a really big bang. Again, um, you're never going to find this language anywhere, but it's the real language that peers use. Um, um, the students in Greece did extensive um, research in both English, for example, they used the web uh, to carry out research in English, so they were engaged in reading in the language, and Greek, they went to local museums on topics uh, such as ancient Greece. They were con communicating with their uh, peers in Canada who were also doing projects relating to ancient Greece. And, and if we look at transformative uh, pedagogy here, one example is uh, students wrote to the editors of uh, an online magazine called Dr. Dig to complain about their use of the term Elgin marbles. Um, these were the marble statues taken from the Parthenon um, by Lord Elgin in the early 1800s, and they currently uh, sit in Britain, and, uh, which is a strong ir irritant to the Greeks. Uh, these students were outraged when they heard the story of this, and they engaged in writing in English to the editors of this magazine to complain. Um, they also uh, collaborated in finishing off um, a story. Uh, a well-known children's Greek author uh, gave him the beginning, or gave the project the beginning of a story that he'd started but hadn't finished, and so students were invited to uh, complete it. Um, they uh, produced a, a large number of endings to the story. There was about 80 uh, endings written in all. Uh, they were going back and forth. They would ask if kids in Greece wanted to know what typical Canadian animals were, uh, what a raccoon was. Could they send a picture of a raccoon because they wanted to put a raccoon into their um, stories? And again, you had engagement with the language uh, in, a, in a way that uh, students uh, didn't want to go out for recess. They couldn't wait until the two periods a week when they had the computer connection uh, going. And so it's not hard to do this. Um, the teachers in Greece, uh, when we debriefed with them, they said in the beginning we were really um, concerned about this because uh, we were missing out on things that we were supposed to cover in the textbook um, uh, because they were spending one third of their time on this project. But they said it seems to work out okay. The students uh, seem to have picked up a lot of English doing this. Um, Um, okay, so there's, just I'd like to just try and wrap up, there's a multitude of imaginative projects out there uh, relating to teaching second languages um, and uh, also relating to the teaching of immigrant uh, students whose achievement uh, is often quite disappointing. But it's not very accessible. You can, um, you can do searches, you can go to sites like the Council of Europe site or other sites, the multiliteracy site that uh, we developed has a lot of this stuff there. But typically teachers don't have the time to do this. Uh, and so what um, uh, we're tr starting to do uh, at the moment in the Toronto context is to use uh, the curriculum guidelines, curriculum expectations uh, that the Ministry of Education has generated for each subject um, uh, to, um, uh, to use that as a portal for getting into more imaginative forms of pedagogy. Um, so in other words, uh, the example I'm going to show you comes from a grade five uh, teacher teaching math in a school that we're working in in the Toronto area. Um, if we look at uh, the possibility of having these electronic versions of the, teacher expect or the curriculum expectations up on the web so that any teacher, what they're going to do in the beginning of the year is check out what they're supposed to teach. If they see a variety of expectations that have been highlighted in blue, hyperlinked, they can click on them and they can go to a list of projects that have been carried out by teachers um, uh, where these expectations have been met in ways that uh, are more imaginative, more intellectually challenging, and more engaging for students. This is um, a project um, uh, created by a teacher, Tobin Zygmanis, uh, who was a, a grade five teacher in Thornwood Public School. And um, he was looking at data management, and I'll just show you some of the um, slides that he did. He basically had his students uh, 
uh, meet curriculum expectations in the data management unit by carrying out surveys, uh, a, a survey of the, all of the languages spoken in the school. And this is a highly multilingual school with about 60 different languages spoken in it. So um, this again is from his PowerPoint describing the project. So they started off by connecting to students' lives. We quickly found out that our class spoke several languages fluently. And now here's your chance to find out how diverse your school is. So they divided up into groups. And these are the groups, the wizards, masterminds, etc. Um, and each group took a particular grade level to survey. They figured out what questions they wanted to ask. And then they generated all kinds of graphs to, to talk about their findings. So he, uh, in his PowerPoint, he, he goes to the curriculum expectations that are generated by the ministry, uh, and these are some of them uh, that are there, and he articulates what these are. Now, what I'm talking about is that if we were to go, if we were to start from the curriculum expectations, so that um, these uh, expectations could be hyperlinked to projects such as the ones that uh, uh, Tom Zygmanis did and, and many others dealing with math or dealing with second languages, then we provide a way for teachers to get access to alternative, more imaginative ways of meeting curriculum expectations so that the pedagogy can potentially be transformed um, as a result of this. So these were the questions that they um, uh, generated. Obviously very simple, it's not complicated. So these are all some of the graphs that students uh, produced. Um, they ran out of time before, uh, this is done in the spring, uh, last spring, but you can imagine this being reported back in the school newsletter or up on the website so that parents can get into it and look at the language diversity of the school. And what this is doing is legitimating students' knowledge of other languages. There are students in the school who speak three, four, five languages, uh, and they can feel proud of the fact that they have this, this linguistic talent. We're teaching math, mathematics here. Not language, but we're teaching it in such a way that students are learning how to use various graphing procedures, they're talking about data management, but they're also getting reinforced in terms of their identity as multilingual uh, speakers. So let me just wrap up by uh, articulating a few conclusions here. First of all, Despite the fact that examples of intellectually rich and imaginative pedagogy abound in subjects across the curriculum, um, instruction in general, and in second language teaching in particular, still tends to stay within the boundaries of transmission orientations. Now, obviously, this is a generalization. There, is, uh, there would be a lot of variation here, but uh, it certainly uh, would be... Um, would reflect my observations in the Canadian context and in a number of other contexts. Um, it's the exceptional teacher that goes beyond just transmission of what's in the curriculum. And this is particularly the case for students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Many of these students are seen as being at risk and uh, teachers are under pressure to raise their achievement. Uh, and so they tend to get um, less intellectually challenging uh, uh, instruction, partly because uh, teachers are, uh, may fear that they're not capable of doing this, uh, and partly because in a less structured environment, they may fear that there's going to be behavioral uh, issues that come up. So uh, when we look at, at students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, we see a pedagogical divide uh, that has emerged quite strongly in places like the United States and possibly other places to a, to a lesser extent. Um, the research data, the hard data, shows clearly that transmission approaches are significantly less effective than inquiry-focused approaches in developing achievement. Uh, literacy engagement and language engagement are key to developing literacy and language skills. And so if we were thinking in terms of creating an empowering context for teachers, for language professionals in our schools, then it's a question to start off with is to, to have teachers talk about the extent to which there's actual, real, uh, authentic engagement with language going on uh, in their language teaching classrooms. Um, and if, they, if teachers say, well, they can't because their language skills are not good enough to do that, well, then maybe we should rethink our assumption that the first language has no place 
uh, in, the, uh, in the classroom. There's all kinds of data showing strong positive relations across languages. And maybe in our French immersion classrooms in Canada or in CLIL classrooms in, in Europe, the target language uh, teachers should be getting together with the mother tongue teachers to, to coordinate projects where students are writing, uh, sto writing creative stories or carrying out projects maybe in their mother tongue initially and then coming up with a target language version of this and publishing it on the web showcasing their bilingual uh, abilities. They may not have those abilities in place right now but we can get students to uh, far outperform their current level of ability in the language using scaffolding strategies of the ones similar to the ones that I demonstrated. But this involves maybe challenging some of the assumptions we've had. One of them, an obvious one being that translation is um, uh, not acceptable in the language classroom, that the first language is something to be shoved out to the extent possible. The examples that I've shown you have shown how productive it can be when we bring the languages together uh, in order to enable students to create identity texts or other intellectually um, powerful work. And the final point that I made is that policymakers and school administrators can easily open up the pedagogical space by electronically linking curriculum expectations to actual examples of intellectually rich pedagogy that addresses these expectations. And they can strongly encourage teachers to expand beyond a narrow transmission focus. I think a lot of teachers stay within transmission orientations because they assume that that's what their school principals, head teachers and administrators expect them to do, that this is appropriate pedagogy. But if the message were to come to teachers, look, we want you to take risks, we want you to explore uh, alternative ways, we want you to find uh, intellectually engaging and challenging ways of addressing students' um, uh, language learning. And we want to see the output. We want stuff up on the web that showcases not only students' linguistic talents, but their intellectual talents. I think we could open up the space uh, not only for students to achieve much more, but for teachers, for language professionals to s generate a real sense of empowerment, understood as the collaborative creation of power. So thank you.